Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so, uh, today I'm here to talk to you about Arweave, uh, but I'd also like to, I guess, make a focus on, on what we're calling the composable web. It's essentially the, uh, the analog to uh, DeFi for data. But, but first, Arweave is a permanent information storage ledger. Uh, we've been running on mainnet for nearly um, five years at this point, five years in a month's time, I think. There's something like 752 million pieces of data stored in the network at the moment. Uh, it's been growing at a relatively exponential pace, uh, more or less since the beginning, but with a big peak in the, uh, the bull market there when people were minting a ton of NFTs. But now uh, usage of the network is almost double uh, where it was even at the peak of the bull market. Um, as well as storing data for people, it has its own native ecosystem of applications built on top of it. Basically, when you have permanent information storage, it turns out that there's a ton of other useful stuff you can build with it. Um, a simple example would be that when you have permanent data storage, you can make permanent web applications, web applications that aren't under the control of a single individual and can't go down uh, either by someone not paying a bill uh, or by someone wantonly deciding that they, they want to change the, uh, the contents of a page. So you essentially get user rights in the same way that you get them with protocols, but for web applications when they're built in this fashion. So there's, there's something like 100 approximately uh, core Arweave ecosystem projects that are building just on the Arweave stack, hundreds more, um, maybe I guess, yeah, hundreds more of, I would say, like, major VC-funded projects that are building, um, yeah, building on Arweave as a data storage layer, and then somewhere in the thousands, I think it's like 2,000 or 3,000 uh, repositories on GitHub that depend on the Arweave JS library alone. So it's pretty hard to keep track of like all the different uses of the system, but, but there's lots. Um, in fact, today, just 10 minutes ago, Lens moved to Arweave, which is pretty exciting. They're the largest Web3 uh, social media network, and now they're storing all their data and interactions on top of the network. Um, one of the things people use Arweave for is storing NFTs. So these are essentially tradable pieces of information, right? It's so the idea that you should be able to sponsor a piece of data in cyberspace and then trade that sponsorship around. So your name is the name that shows up next to the piece of data. Uh, in the Solana ecosystem, we have something like 90% of the NFTs that are minted are stored on Arweave. In other ecosystems, it sort of varies, but we, we see a strong trend of people using uh, the network in this way. This has given us a lot of cause to think about, well, great, the data is permanent. That makes a lot of sense if you're going to trade, uh, trade interest in it, right? You don't want the data to disappear if you're going to trade ownership of it. Makes sense. But there's more that you should be able to do with this. Like, you should be able to remix data in the same way that you remix smart contracts in DeFi, right? In DeFi, we can say, okay, cool, you've built a useful primitive. Well, I can then go and build, I don't know, for example, maybe the primitive, I was going to say DAI, although it's not clear to me how useful DAI is anymore. <laughs> um, but single collateralized DAI from back in the day, you build a useful, stable unit of value. Then I can go and build a lending market on top of it, or I can build a, uh, a swapping system that allows me to trade um, you know, other tokens for that unit. Right? Everything is remixable, and that, that was where the power of this uh, DeFi ecosystem really came from, and I think where Ethereum and the smart contract networks have cemented themselves most, most clearly. Um, you should be able to do the same with data, right? So when you have an NFT and you store the data on Arweave, then the data is not in a centralized silo that's controlled by one person who can control the access to it and revoke the access, potentially change the data. It's in a big open data lake. So in theory, you should be able to get yeah, the analog of that DeFi composability, but with information itself. The theory is good, I think, but in practice, this hasn't emerged en masse yet. We think that we're extremely early to this, would you say, like phase of the market. Um, the, the market has mostly been focused on finance, if we look at blockchains more widely, since the beginning. Like, when you think about what a, what a blockchain is, it's a trust computer. It's basically a machine that allows you to uh, operate a program with no trust in a centralized party. And Satoshi was pretty wise, I think, in applying that in the first instance to the place where trust is most expensive, which is currency. Because like, if you 
mint 10% more of the currency every year, then you're just like stealing 10% of the value of the economy. That's a very, very high burden of trust. And then the next was finance, right? So, okay, the financial institutions we have in our society, we trust them uh, to a huge degree, and if they fail, uh, the whole economy fails. Like, basically, we don't let them fail. Like, they're so important to, to the way of life of the people. So, large cost of trust there. We think that the next frontier is information. So, when you, when you go about your daily life, you're basically trusting centralized arbiters, or would you say, like, directors of the flow of information, all the time, you, you trust the, the newspaper editors, you trust the journal editors, you, you trust people that carry information uh, as a normal part of daily life. It's a, it's a high cost uh, area, but, but we think that we're just at the start of this ecosystem beginning to emerge in, in crypto or with these trust computers. So what has held us back from making composable data work in practice so far? Things fundamentally twofold. Uh, there's lack of structure to data in the previous systems, and there's also incentive incompatibility. So lack of structure to data. Uh, the system that people used to store NFTs or NFT data before Arweave was either a centralized server or IPFS. IPFS is an openly addressable data space, but you address things by its content ID. Problem with that, of course, is that Content IDs don't really tell you much about the data. So your data might be in this big open data lake next to my data, but if I can't query it and say, hey, give me all of the social media posts, then it's not really much use to me, right? So I can't compose on it if I can't find stuff in that uh, data space properly. So with Arweave from the beginning, because we were trying to build a permanent ledger of information and knowledge, uh, we structured the whole thing like ledger entries, right? So you have strong provenance of who uploaded a piece of data, when did they upload it, and critically, tags, arbitrary tags on top of trans every single transaction in the network. So this means that you can say, okay, uh, those Lens posts, for example, those social media posts that the flow just started running like two or three hours ago, we were just before we got up here, watching that happen and, and we're watching people like, you know, send their tweets or, or lens equivalents of tweets and they're hitting the network. You can go look at those transactions and you see, oh, they're all tagged in a way that you can, that gives structure to the data. And that's pretty cool because it means that you can use one of the indexing systems on top of Arweave to find that data. So now it's not just a big open data lake where you refer to things by the hash of the data, which can't be searched. Instead, it's the opposite. It's like the whole web becomes a big open database. When you have that, you have the ability to create applications on top. So this is now.arweave.dev. This is a, a web application. As I was describing, it's hosted on the perm web itself. The person that created this and uploaded it to the network cannot change this web application. They can issue a new one, and you can use it if you want. But you have guarantees in the same way that when you use Bitcoin, you know that no one's going to be able to change the protocol. You know that no one's going to be able to step in and say, actually, I don't like that content, or you know, this is not my politics, and so I will change it. You get guarantees as a user. And that web application itself is built in such a fashion that it is querying the network. So anyone can write data into this open data space, and if you give it the right tags, it will show up on here. So now you have this situation where all of the applications in the ecosystem are naturally and fluidly uh, sharing their data in a way that is, is open. So as a new developer getting started in this ecosystem, this is a pretty cool, um, what do you say, a, a pretty promising uh, proposition. Instead of starting from zero with an empty database, you can just say, well, give me all of Lens's social media posts. And boom, now suddenly you don't have a cold start problem. It's pretty neat. But the second problem, I think, was bigger, incentive alignment. In Web2, data is a moat, right? I want to keep my data uh, private if I'm a developer. Like, I might have, you know, uh, what do you say, altruistic ideals, and you like, like the idea of, yeah, it's cool, you know, I'm issuing these NFTs, and so the NFTs are technically accessible somewhere else. But like, if you're not paid to do so in some way, if it takes away from your revenue, 
like ultimately over a long enough period of time, it just won't happen. And I think this is, this is like, look, frankly, before we had open uh, querying, you just couldn't build properly composable web applications anyway. But now that we, we have that, I think unless we solve this problem, no one's gonna do it. And that feels like the stage of the market that we're in. Um, so until now, I think Web3 hasn't presented a better alternative to this. It said, well, look, in theory, you can do this, but you're not paid to, so no one does. Okay, uh, well, I think early last year, we started working with Creative Commons, the people that created the CC licensing uh, standards that are used for, I think, like four or five billion pieces of information on the internet, um, to make a web where uh, licensing was a sort of, what do you say, first class part of the ecosystem. So it turns out, after speaking to Creative Commons, we learned that 97% of the web, as it's currently formulated, is license ambiguous. Just crazy. <laughs> when you access a piece of information, there's a 97% chance that it's not clear whether you can reuse it or not. So we worked with them on a simple licensing standard on top of Arweave. It uses those tags, and it basically lets you um, embed metadata into the information in the permaweb, which is this sort of web that lives inside Arweave, um, that says, OK, uh, you can reuse this information in this way and that way, but not in that way. Like you have to attribute, you know, give me attribution, but you can reuse it uh, or whatever uh, form you like. And the Creative Commons licenses were the first licenses that you could use in the system, but it's open. Anyone can add a license and then anyone can refer to it. And this is now spread through the uh, infrastructure in the Arweave ecosystem. And so it's pretty common to see, for example, on Block Explorer, oh, I can see the licensing of the data directly with the data itself. This is kind of cool, right? So if someone sent you this transaction ID and you sent it to your web browser, you went arweave.net stroke that ID, it would render for you. You could see the web page. But then you put that same identifier into the Block Explorer and it would show you the licensing information. So you can't uh, communicate the reference to the data without also communicating the license information. And so we think that we can change it from a 97% license ambiguous web to virtually 0% using a system like this. So today we are, uh, actually not quite today, but in the last month or so, we've been working on, on releasing the open data license. This is a new licensing standard um, or at least the start of a new licensing standard that you can use to attach to your data uh, that is specifically built to support Web3 composable data use cases. So specifically, uh, you can create or add a license to your data that says, please share the, any revenue that you get from this or some proportion of revenue or some specific uh, revenue quantity like one cent uh, with the owners of the token that is stored inside this piece of data. These we call profit-sharing tokens. So here is a, a GIF of these, um, these hedgehogs are normally uh, clapping, if you see the, <laughs> the animation. Um, but you can see it's an RV transaction. It has a bunch of tags, and one of those tags creates a contract. And that contract can be owned by people. It's a fungible token. And um, when you add this licensing uh, system on top of it, you can say, okay, well, look, anyone can access this, but if you want to use it, you have to pay some license or royalty fee back to the owners of that token. And so now we move from the situation where most of the web is licensed ambiguous, or the developers are incentivized to keep the data mode as private um, and as tightly controlled as possible to, well, look, you can take the information and you can make extra money on it. Like, you can set whatever fee you want. And then if people want to use the data and they want to pay the royalty, they can do so. And then, on top of this, you end up with a web where the royalty streams are all tradable. Because those, um, yes, those profit-sharing tokens, they're just normal tradable assets. And so now, the idea is that we can move towards a world where every revenue flow uh, can be openly disposed of by the creator and purchased by people that have an interest in it and think it will you know, retain value over time. Um, and you can conceivably create funds of those, or automated algorithmic funds of people buying and selling interests 
in the royalty streams created by creators on the web. So these are what we call atomic assets. They've got the data, they've got the tags, the, the metadata, and contracts all built into a single identifier. That identifier is passed, it can be um, queried. You can say, hey, give me all of the social media posts that are licensed like this, where the royalty is under a cent. You can ask the network to give you the, uh, the data from other applications that is relevant to you, and then you can, um, you can present it in your own application. And so we see this moving towards a situation where uh, the web is data first. So at the moment, we see that web applications are, are the sort of kings of the game, if that makes sense. That you, you go to youtube.com, and it is infrastructure, code, and data bundled tightly together uh, in, in a way that the user has no real control of. If you don't want to use YouTube, you just have to go somewhere else. Like, there's no intermediate step. Uh, same with TikTok, same with Twitter. It's, it's all the same paradigm. Whereas we see that, that a web is emerging where data is the atomic unit, and different applications upload data, and they can cut themselves onto the profit-sharing tokens for those pieces of data. They're licensing the data as the creator uploads it. But then that data can be openly remixed by any number of applications and brought back on any other piece of infrastructure that they care to use. So now the user is back in control. And I think the final uh, place that we see this going is, well, OK, so now imagine that you have a web where instead of it being focused on pages, uh, it's focused on individual atomic units of data, whether it be a blog post or a video, image, it doesn't matter. You can conceivably uh, see a world where the user interfaces are actually AI generated. So AI can now generate front-end code extremely well. Um, and we're experimenting with basically creating systems that let you say, hey, I want to see uh, Devon's social media posts for today. And it will know what your preferences are, and it generates an application essentially on the fly to pull back that information for you. The creators, or, or Devon in this case, uh, is being credited because it's, the data is licensed properly. He can trade that interest if he so desires. Um, and I can say, OK, that's kind of cool, but I want like truthiness markets on top of that piece of information as well. And the AI will just do that for you. It, it, it's a world where the user interfaces become extremely thin, almost vanishingly thin. They're just transient pieces of, uh, yeah, transient apps created by AI. Um, all of this that I've described today is, is working in practice. Uh, there's, there's uh, I'd say, a small, small ecosystem at the kernel of this that has demonstrated each of these, um, yeah, concepts in the real world. I was going to show a demo today, but I'm way over time already. <laughs> but if you follow us on Twitter, Forward Research, um, then, yes, we'll be sharing more as this progresses. Thank you. Thank you.